This is the DRF Players Podcast. Hello and welcome to the DRF Players Podcast. This is show 247, the June 16th, 2017 edition. I briefly considered making it the Father's Day edition, but I, I thought we had enough um, fun kid stuff with Austin Kinchin's cameo from earlier in the week, so I decided to go a different direction. We're going to make this the Bloomsday edition. Um, I'll get to that in a minute for those of you. Some of you are nodding your heads and others are like, what is he on about now? We'll get to that in a minute. One of the people I'm guessing nodding his head, not nodding his head and saying, what is he on about now, is my co-host for the day. Oh, I'm Peter Thomas Fornatel, by the way, here in the Brooklyn Bunker. And my co-host for the day, calling in from Planet Texas, he's the people's champ. He's Jonathan Kinchin. JK, what's up? What's going on? I have no idea what the heck you're talking about. <laughs> Have you ever read, Did you? were you ever forced in a class to read James Joyce? I have a confession. <laughs> I'm not going to like what I'm about to hear, am I? I am a graduate of the University of Texas. Um, however, the first book I read all the way through was a book called Stone Fox in third grade. Uh, it was about like these, I don't remember, it was like a, uh, anyways, like a Eskimo story. I don't think I read an entire book until I was in college and I read Steve Davidowitz's Betting on Thoroughbreds. That's the honest to God truth. I cliff notes and, and like Googled my way through school. <laughs> um, so to answer your question, no, I've never read that book. I, I, I love the 10 year generation gap that you had the opportunity to Google your way through school. Back in my day when we couldn't read the assignment, we had to get the cliff notes. Gosh darn it. Um, but okay, so Bloomsday is this day, June 16th, 1904, the entirety of James Joyce's Ulysses takes place on this day. And the reason I mention it here, well, a couple of reasons I mention it. One, uh, one of my favorite books of all time. I love Joyce, studied Joyce in college, uh, wrote my thesis actually, uh, about James Joyce. And what I realized looking back is that I got the thesis all wrong. And if I had it to do all over again, I would not have written about Leopold Bloom, the central character, and his relationship with his daughter, Millie. I would have written about the very real subplot in this book, Ulysses, that involves horse racing. Because I guess back in 1904, the Royal Ascot meeting happened a little bit earlier. Everything in this book ties into to history. There's a lot of like amazingly factual stuff. And there are several conversations within the course of the book about the Ascot Gold Cup, which I'm imagining was run on that day. And I missed my chance. So, J.K., let me ask you this. If I'm going to get you to read a dense literary 400-page book, is this going to be the one? Uh, is there going to be a, is there going to be a hint at a winner at Ascot in the book? <laughs> there, 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 it's not impossible. He goes pretty into the weeds, I think, talk, if I remember correctly, um, giving a description of the race. Maybe there'd be something applicable about what type of horse is likely to win at, uh, two and a half miles at the Royal Meeting. Royal Meeting, of course, next week for folks interested in a lot of specifics on it. I've got a few options for you. We're going to have great coverage, previews and reviews in Daily Racing Forum written by our international correspondents, Marcus Hirsch and Steve Anderson. I will be putting up thoughts on races from a betting perspective, sort of a sponsored by DRF Bets bloggy kind of content that I'm looking forward to doing. I'll be putting those up in the moments, uh, probably about 15 minutes to post. I'll be looking to put those up via DRF Live. So if you just follow along the DRF homepage, you can have Ask It on a TV or, or other screen, and you can have uh, my comments popping up periodically on the homepage. Hopefully we'll be able to come up with some winners for you. If you want some great insight into the races from now, had the pleasure yesterday of sitting down with Marcus Hirsch and Nick Luck and Simon and Rollins previewing the meeting. Um, all three men had some interesting ideas. You can find the replay of that broadcast, drf.com slash YouTube. Folks looking for further information about the Ask It meeting, I will refer you to timeform.com. Uh, 
the, the sister site or parent site, whatever you want to call it, of Timeform U.S., Lots of great info there that U.S. race goers will appreciate, um, as well as the At The Races website has a lot of excellent coverage. This is the U.K. At The Races TV, not to be confused with the excellent Steve Bick At The Races radio show. But as long as Bick came up, you can also check out Nick Luck's appearance on there. And Steve's done a great job not only supporting that meeting in recent years and having a lot of relevant content, but also, I believe, even broadcasting some of the calls. Does that sound right, Jake? Okay. It does. And, and speaking of broadcasting, um, I'm pretty excited. I, I'm looking to find the details. I'm pretty excited. It, it's Ask it's going to be on NBC Sports, I think, every morning. Yes, that sounds right. That's going to be exciting. Get up at uh, 730, you know, I guess my time, 830 yours, and and uh, pop that on and have a smoothie, I guess. And, <laughs> and uh, hey, I'm a sucker for racing in HD, people that, that know me. Um, I'm the guy that will like be at the TV flipping through it until we can find the HD one because it drives me nuts that we have the ability and we don't get it. Uh, I love the home of the Kentucky Derby. Um, as an old Twin Spires guy, they were the first ADW that I knew about that broadcast online in HD. They had that, Calder, Fairgrounds, all in HD, and I loved it. It was awesome, and now it's like the worst feed in the world and I don't understand why they can't catch up with uh, the Santa Anitas and the Nairas and the, and everyone else and, and broadcast over the Internet in HD. It, it drives me nuts. So it's exciting for me to be able to have an opportunity to watch European racing in HD. I, I think the colors and the pageantry and, and actually being able to watch the jockeys, the racing – is so much better in, in high definition. As a trip notes player, JK, it makes a real difference, doesn't it? Oh my goodness. Like it makes the hugest difference. If you like, for instance, if you want to watch on RTN, you can watch Santa Anita's replays in HD, right? The pan. The head on, however, is is in like standard definition, and you can sometimes not tell the four horse from the seven horse. You know, it's impossible. The silks are kind of, you know, it's just, it's a nightmare. Now, if you go to Naira's website, which I've tweeted about it before, how awesome their media presentation is, the head-on is in HD as well. So the the greatest thing about the head-on being in HD is you can identify, you can almost see little flaps of the saddle cloth from the head-on to see that it's yellow and know that it's the four horse. It's, it's, uh, it's an absolute life changer. You can see jockeys uh, tapping shoulders in the head-on in HD. You can't always see that. You can see them scrubbing. You can see uh, their heads being cocked. You can see so much. Um, You can see when they're shying away from kickback. It's so much, so much better. Uh, to be able to do trip notes and, and high definition. Those are such great points, and I think one of the key ones for me is the ability to catch how the rider is communicating with the horse that much more intimately, to be able to know how much a horse was being asked for that speed out of the gate as opposed to that maybe being natural speed that the horse is an indicator that maybe the horse is coming into form while the jockey was sitting more chilly. Good luck trying to discern that stuff in SD. In HD, you can do it. And I know we have a lot of industry people who listen to the show, and I'm so glad you brought this up about HD because I think it's one of those things I I joked before about the 10-year generation gap between us. Uh, I'm totally with you on the HD thing, but it wouldn't surprise me if there were people my age, JK, or older who – our standard for watching broadcasts, like growing up, especially, was so bad. This is a generation that, wa- you know, including myself, watching black and white sporting broadcasts going in and out, or uh, on these big boxy TVs, or, or worse yet, trying to watch a, a sporting event on MSG when we didn't have the, uh, we didn't actually have the channel, and it would be these like weird black bars. Um, swerving back and forth, and you could kind of, you could still hear the call though, and and kind of have an opportunity to see if the puck went in the net. There's somebody out there who knows exactly what I'm talking about. Um, for, so for us, you know, a lot of times I think uh, this generate my generation kind of perfectly happy with a decent SD picture. But one of the things we need to do if we're looking into the future is capture, you know, you and then forget about younger. And the kind of media environment these people have grown up in. This is an on-demand world. This is a top-quality world. And if we're going to be out there trying to be a grade one gambling game offering listed-level uh, videos, it's 
<laughs> it's not a great look. Let's put it that way. No, not at all. I mean, it's 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 our game is is beautiful for a lot of reasons, and one of the reasons that you know when when you have these conversations about why our game is so special is the visuals, right? The the colors, the the horses, the equine physicality, and 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 the competition, and those things are just so much better in high definition. Um, and I know it sounds kooky, but you know I think we've it's already passed. But you know, t- take a look at a golf tournament. In, in high definition next time you're flipping through the channels. It like it it really does something to you. It just makes you feel like you're there. The grass, it's so green. I I just I'm a sucker for a for a good picture. So uh that uh being having opportunity to watch racing in H D is always exciting for me. I, I love the NBC broadcast. The it's the only reason why I wish I wouldn't go to the Derby is because there's nothing better than sitting at home all day and watching the NBC broadcast, it's the, the it's just it's so much fun. I usually tape it and watch it when I get home. Well, there's no better visuals uh, at a race course in the world than what you're going to see next week at Ascot. The meeting runs from Tuesday through Saturday. Big races every day. Some will have more applications than other immediate applications for USA racing fans. Those will be the ones that I'll looking I'll be looking to highlight. I'm sure Marcus and Steve will be looking to highlight. If nothing else. Um, if you can't stand the fact that you can't get your DRF style PPs and you're, you're not going to bet, watch anyway. Try to watch the biggest races of the day anyway. Lots of implications in terms of the Breeders' Cup and beyond, uh, Arlington Million. These are some of the most important races that will be run over there all year. And it's worth any uh, big racing fan paying attention, trying to get stuck in a little bit. And if you have a chance to make a few bets and make a few dollars, all the better. Right, J.K.? Absolutely. And speaking of pictures, before we get off of the pictures, is is there going to be a picture of Pete Fornatal in a monkey suit with a hat? <laughs> I've done it before. Such a picture exists. I wonder if I have it on this computer here still. I think this I, I don't know if it made the transfer. It might be on on a hard drive sitting in the in the in the dusty uh basement portion of the Brooklyn bunker. But I have done the full morning suit. And but I'm not going to do it this year. And it, it's funny. I really went back and forth. There was a lot of debate uh, with with friends. I spoke to one uh, Irish friend who will remain nameless, who, like me, will have a, uh, just a press pass. The press pass doesn't get you into the area where you need the full what they call morning dress, the top hat and tails. Um, and he was like, well, just do it anyway. You know, we'll we'll somebody will invite us at some point or we'll figure out a way to get through and, you know, we'll have access to all these other areas. It was very like situation that seemed like it was possibly going to put me in a socially awkward situation. And I was picturing myself having been turned away by a guard at the Royal Enclosure, going back to my little cubby in the dungeon-like Ascot press area in my top hat and tails where everyone else is just wearing like normal finery and just feeling like a complete an utter idiot. So I, I decided after consulting with a few other friends that the wiser move is just to dress nicely. Yeah, there might be a couple of parties I can't get into and I might be the only person in a suit in a couple of social situations, whether it's in the parking lot or, or up in a box um, where I'm the only one not wearing it. But you know, I'll just play it off as, Hey, I'm, I'm there. I'm a working journalist. Uh, the suit will be fancy enough for me. So you're not going to get a chance to make fun of me this time, Jonathan. Ah, it's too bad. And somewhere in California, you've, you've made some people roll over in their grave by referring to something at Ascot as the dungeon. <laughs> That's a very good point. I shouldn't have disrespected the actual dungeon that way. But but I, I'll send a picture. You'll see what I mean. It's uh, I don't think I'll be – I think it's going to be the kind of thing where I will hopefully find two feet of workspace – be able to run in there, type a quick post for DRF Live, and get right back in the sunshine. That's my plan. I want to be out amongst. Uh, I want to be out amongst the punters. I mean, that's the other thing about Ascot that I think uh, is interesting. I don't think you're going to find a lot of real. Yeah, you'll find horsemen with horses in, and there'll be cool, interesting stuff going on in the Royal. But I'm a, almost more interested in finding out where you know the pro betters are hanging out, and which which stand they're in, and which bookies they're walking up and down the line shopping for the best prices at the last minute. That's a little bit more my jam, anyway. I don't you think? absolutely now i've never been so indulge me you can just there's like a window you can go to and bet right 
Well, there's tote betting, yes, and that will be the international commingled pool. A lot of these races, I'm not sure if every race is commingled. There might be some technology limitation based on the number of betting interests, but a race like uh, the Queen Anne, for example, the same bet you can make on DRF bets will go into the pool that I could go up to the tote pool and bet in Ascot. But sort of the rule of thumb in the UK uh, at least among my snobby friends, is that the tote over there is basically for grannies, and you know the the the, the proper adults are going to be betting either with the bookies or on the exchange. So uh, hopefully, I'll have those options available to me. The exception might be with the the chance to bet some USA style exotics in what should be some crazy, weird, tilted pools in bets like the exacta and trifecta, potentially. There may be a little bit of arbitrage opportunities. This is the kind of stuff I'll be blogging about next week. I'll try to point out if I see a toad opportunity that I think is really worth seizing upon. That's the kind of thing I'll be mentioning. But I would imagine most of my action will be walking uh, and, and betting with the bookies outside. I like it. I'll be, I'll be tell, hopefully I message works. So I can uh, text you some some uh, Wesley Ward uh, winners. Yeah, you got to get all the steam for me. I I, I know you're uh, you're Mister Info, J.K. I'll be, don't <laughs> let me down. It's gonna be uh, it's gonna be fun. I mean, we've got uh, Happy Like a Fool. We've got Fairyland. He's got a strong looking contingent. Marcus made some very interesting points about Fairyland on the show. I recommend that everybody check that out once again. Uh, DRF.com slash YouTube. You can check out the Royal Ascot uh, preview session. Let's answer a couple of questions, JK, before we get on to um, the bulk of, well, I don't know if it's going to end up being the bulk, but the the meat of our show, we're going to talk about those five stakes races on Stephen Foster night. But before we get to that, um, I had just a great question the other day about, and I'll just ask it, we didn't rehearse this or anything, so I'll just ask you, if someone asks you the meaning of the word wise guy in a horse racing context, what's the first thing that comes to mind? A person who thinks they're smarter than they are. Okay. Yeah, and that is and that is absolutely one of the big definitions of it, and we use it that way all the time when we're talking about a horse. We mentioned a wise guy horse who's a horse that's maybe 12 to 1 in the morning line who we know that's going to go off at, at 4 to 1. What, what's another, uh, and, and, therefore, and in the process, any value that might have been there is going to be shed. Can you think of another example when in a horse racing contest you might use, you might use wise guy? Yeah, I, I think that wise guy is also um, – it's kind of like the Stephen A. Smith um, and that other moron that, that – uh, what's his name? Uh, Skip, Skip Bayless. Bayless. Where where they, they say something that's so outlandish that if they're right, they do it on purpose because if they're right, they look like a genius. And if they're wrong, they're like, what? It was outlandish anyways. Right. And to me, I think that that happens in racing a lot. Oh, well, so-and-so is going to win. And it's like, but you're not betting that horse. You're just saying that because if you're right, you'll look smart. And if you're wrong, it's like, well, whatever. I couldn't beat the one to five Todd and you're going to condemn me for that. So I, that's another angle of kind of wise guy that I that I kind of uh, would subscribe to. That's a major party foul, by the way. Any analyst giving out picks, not betting the pick. I mean, you know, it's one thing if you have to do every race every day. But if you're going out there and saying so-and-so is going to win in some declarative way and then are only doing that for like the juice on your show and not betting it, that's that's not cool. Not cool one bit. But my point about wise guy is that it is what a, a word – this is the, the, the English major edition of the DRF Players podcast – a word known as an antagonym where – the, it's it's the same word, right? But it has two meanings, and the meanings are opposite. So, like, I'll give you a couple examples of antagonyms before we before we uh, talk more about wise guy. But you know, you could a uh, bad is a great example. You could say something's bad, or you could say, you know, oh man, he bad, and meaning like the guy's great. Or you can say, I mean, there there there's so many of them. A word like buckle has that, uh, you know, it can mean to hold together, it can mean to fall apart, to buckle under pressure, that kind of thing. Um, th- there's, 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 you know, I could, I could spend the rest of the show telling you about uh, antagonisms. But in the context of wise guy, oh, literally, we, we said, I've never made my full literally rant. Literally, the word it used to mean, um, it used to mean literal. It used to mean what actually happened. And it came to mean um, 
hypothetical or what's the be- what's a better word to describe it it came to mean um basically the opposite of what it actually means where you can say you know his head literally exploded when his head didn't literally explode he was just really excited or upset or whatever to complete the the line of thought thinking but so with wise guy you know i'll also say sometimes sincerely when studying the form of a horse oh he's got a little bit of a wise guy look meaning there's something hidden there's something that rates um a special analysis to try to see or you might say it respectfully of a player you might say oh yeah like he's an old school wise guy meaning somebody who you know helped uh, somebody who was into trip handicapping in the 1970s who graduated from harness and got into thoroughbreds so it's just it it was such a good question because i realized i've used it in I, i think what had happened is it was in the car ride out to belmont and i used it in the sincere context and somebody said to me, oh, you know, I thought you only used that tongue-in-cheek. And, and no, I mean, I think it's a word you can, that you can use in either direction. Or for you, JK, is it, do you only use that one uh, sort of ironically? Yeah, I was going to say negatively, but I guess ironically would be better – would be the, would be the you know, more accurate way of describing it. No, I don't really use it I, – I, I can't really think of a time I've used it as a term of endearment. Like, oh, he's a real wise guy. <laughs> I could use that description of several people we hang out at the paddock bar in uh, in Saratoga for, honestly. But it's uh, it's one of those things, you know, liquid language moving in all different directions. But anyway, wanted to clear that up. Wise guy, a bit of an antagonist, but probably the more common usage is the sort of uh, tongue-in-cheek version. We got a few other questions here. We had another – we had one about um, – Del Mar. This one's interesting. We've got lots of feeders for the upcoming Del Mar contest, also upcoming win challenge on the DRF Tournament's website right now. So why not a Del Mar question? Um, Greg wants to know, what is Del Mar's equivalent of Santa Anita's Eddie Logan suite? JK, I'll kick this one to you. Well, God bless where the turf meets the surf, but they don't really have one. Uh, and and <laughs> How about this? The wise guy move... <laughs> Um, well, I guess that is actually a term of endearment. Yeah. I am saying no, that's it's the right. smart thing to do. Exactly. That's right. actually a better example than anything I use, by the way. It's like you'll be driving to the track and you can sit on the highway with the mopes or the wise guy moves to go through this neighborhood here and, and cut around and get jumped, up, jumped yeah. off right at Hempstead Turnpike. That's an even better positive wise guy. Good, good Look at one. that. It was an English lesson. <laughs> um, so the wise guy move at Del Mar, there's two things you can do. There's uh, – I can't remember the name of it either. I'm going to go blank. Maybe Pete will know. There's a Mexican restaurant that looks out over the paddock. If you can get a table looking out over the paddock, it's no Eddie Logan suite, and you will pay for your food and drinks. But it's a great view where you can look out in the paddock. You can enjoy the fact that you're in San Diego and the ocean's right around the corner. You can walk right through there, walk right out onto the – to the uh, to the grandstand and watch the races from there. So that's kind of a wise guy move. <clears throat> the other move at Del Mar, and this is kind of a before the races thing, is the Brigantine. If you can get there for a couple of drinks before the races start, it actually is at like the I would say it's probably equivalent to like the half mile pole of the racetrack. Yeah. So it right. looks it looks down at the track, and it's a pretty beautiful thing. TVG's on. There's usually a lot of people that are excited about the races. The drinks and the, and the appetizers are really good. So those are the wise guy moves if I was going to Del Mar, how I would do it. But there's really no Eddie Logan suite at Del Mar. And I, I mean no offense at all, and if they take offense, sorry. But they do have like a little VIP room, but it's kind of embarrassing. Like it's like a like a kind of like a closet. And I don't I mean I don't even know if there's food and drinks in there. It's just kind of a place where you can go and you don't have to jack around with betting lines and stuff like that. Um, but I, I've been there once, and I don't. I mean, I, I would just prefer walk around, you know, on the first floor. So uh, there's really no Eddie Logan suite there. There are suites upstairs that I know they do sometimes put VIP betters in that don't that sound much better than the closet scenario you're describing. Have you ever been up in those? I believe they have the contest in in one of them. Um, but I think then there's other ones that are like more private. If the, this question is asked by somebody who's going to be handling a tremendous amount of money, it's certainly worth considering reaching out to Del Mar and, and inquiring about options. But do you, do you know these suites I'm talking about? The only suite I've ever – I've never been in like an individual suite. The only uh, – I've been in the dining room on the sixth floor where they have the tournament. 
And that room is phenomenal. If you can get a table in there, I don't know if it's private or what they do in a normal situation, but it's amazing. It's actually one of the best views in racing, in my opinion. You're extremely high up, almost like I could compare it to like, uh, you know, Travis's booth at Churchill. I mean, you're at the highest point at the racetrack. It's at the top of the stretch at about the eighth pole. Um, in fact, it's I stood there on the roof watching Songbird break her maiden. You could, it's tr- it's a tremendous place to watch racing, but I, I don't know if it's open to the public on a normal day. It was just we were just up there for the tournament when I was there. I think anytime you're expecting to handle. Um, a really significant amount of money. It's worth reaching out to attracts customer service people, getting their perspective. Of the other things that J.K. said, I, I like both those ideas. There's the great um, tradition that we used to do uh, once in a while. We'd actually leave after the eighth race, if there, was, if there were nine, you leave after the second to last race and actually watch the nightcap from the brig, um, which is a lot of fun. Um you you sort of get to jump on things. I guess that's like the the Ciro's. It's a little bit of a Ciro's equivalent, but it's you know it's got its own vibe and you know fish tacos and it's not um, it's not quite as uh, priced out the at the wazoo as as Ciro's is. But if you're if you're somebody who likes Ciro's, definitely check out the Brig. That's a fun option. And that restaurant on the second floor um, that J.K. was mentioning, I can't for the life of me remember the name of it. Um, the food is nothing to speak of, but you do get that amazing view. That's the place where famously I went to place the bet and thought my daughter was happy watching a show. And Duke Matisse had to call me while I was in the betting line and tell me to get back there because my daughter was asking for me. And I felt like a very, very sick degenerate that day. <laughs> Duke Duke, uh, Duke was probably trying to call, uh, try to get some bets in himself. And he, 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 so he was really struggling with uh, what was happening there. <laughs> Uh, I try to remember the name. I'm trying to look it up. I'll find it. Oh, the Veranda Cafe is the name. It's it's called the Veranda. And in so. terms of the specific person people might reach out to, my best contact at Del Mar, I've worked with him over, with contest stuff over the years, is Chris Barr. But what's his proper job? Is he does he deal with player services? Is he somebody that uh, high roller types might want to seek out? Um, I'm not a hundred percent sure if that's exactly what his title is, but I would imagine that he could steer you in the right direction. I mean, he's the one who contacts us about the tournaments, lets us know, and then he directs us to someone, uh, to like, you know, get our hotels and, and all of that stuff. And if we need seats for another day, that's not the tournament. So I would imagine that he could at least steer you in the right direction if, uh, if he wasn't the one that could handle all those issues. So speaking of Del Mar, JK, sounds like you've got some exciting plans according to uh, this website of this uh, new TV show. Is this? I wasn't sure if it was official yet, but hey, if it's on their website, it must be, eh? Yeah, yeah. Um, I will. Uh, I I got picked to be a uh, a coach, a handicapper for um, their, that new show, Win Play Show. Um, my uh, my show tapes in in July, I believe, at some point. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll be there and, uh, I don't know who my, who I'm going to be paired with, but, um, I, you know, I, I get just like, I, I, the impression I've gotten is that it's like an amateur, like, uh, someone who, uh, you know, has been to the track seven times or, or, or likes it or is interested, or maybe someone who's got really no idea just someone who, who, uh, whatever. So it should be fun. Um, and I, I think it's kind of like a, like tournament style. Like, I, you know, I got to. My my person has to win, and then we move on, and and that type of deal. So should be fun. Any excuse to get out there and hang out at uh, at Del Mar is always uh, always going to be uh, something that I can't pass up. So I'll be there quite a bit. I, I'm planning on going for for opening weekend, um, and then I I go come home, and then I go back for the tournament, which I qualified for, which is the weekend after that, and then uh, and then I got to go to Saratoga to celebrate some jerks <laughs> some jerks birthday. <laughs> Oh, that uh, party's terrible every year. I think you should just skip it. As long as you, as long as you end up in your underwear swimming in your neighbor's pool again, it'll be worth it'll be worth the airfare. And then um, you were asleep then, on the couch by that point. You don't even remember it. But, but I heard. I heard. <laughs> Desiree took video, not helpfully. But you know, it's actually it's a funny story. I don't think we ever told is that when I fell asleep on the couch, I had five hundred dollars in cash. It fell out of my pocket. Someone gave it to you to protect for me. We spent two days stressed out wondering where the heck this $500 I knew I had in my pocket was. 
And eventually you did laundry or did something. We found the five hundred dollars. It was like hitting the pick four and we hadn't even bet. Well they were in the they were in the pants before I went into the water. So I changed into the bathing suit and then sort of, you know, just it was an outdoor party, so there was no real reason to change back into the shorts. So finding them days later, it was it was a huge win. I think we, we high fived as well as we did when we got that eight to one shot uh, down the hill on Periscope when we were uh, when we were kind enough when Santa Anita were kind enough to let us watch a race from the top which which was a, a blast but yeah so before we move on from the show and dive into these races we do have a bunch more questions we'll put a pin in those we'll come back to them for um for next week or if we breeze through these races I guess we can get to them at the end but before we move on from the show it's called win play show do you know when it's going to be airing or where or is this information that you'll give us in due time I think September, it's going to air in September on uh, TVG. So, oh, um, yeah, so it'll be cool. Uh, you know, I, uh, I'm excited to, to see how it goes. It'll be, it'll be interesting to kind of, you know, we've done shows in the past, not we, but the industry has done shows in the past, like, you know, highlighting kind of the people that are already in the game. It'll be fun to kind of, you know, watch someone learn and watch someone, uh, uh, you know, kind of, kind of cut their teeth. It's, apparently one of the things I did read is that like, we are not allowed to make picks for them. We are just allowed to give them guidance. That's smart. Um, so I don't know. Um, I don't know. That's, that might be kind of tough if somebody wants to bet, uh, bet some horse that was, that was loose on the lead when they went 50 to the half and they want to bet him. I'm like, I'm just going to just grit my teeth and be like, no, no, you can't do that. That, that horse was dead loose. So, <laughs> we'll see what happens. It'll be fun watching you grimace, uh, if nothing else. Who are some of the other people who are going to be involved in the show with you? Uh, our friend, yours, more, yours longer than mine, Frank Scatoni, is one of the other uh, uh, coaches or handicappers. I think uh, Vic Stauffer. Um, Chris, I, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, Ado or Addo, um, and, a, and a regular Tyler. regular listener, a huge yeah, friend yeah. of the show, Chris. Yeah, the guys that from, they're, they're two um, uh, wagering ambassadors at Santa Anita, uh, and a guy named Tyler, I, I forget his last name. Um, who else, who else? Uh, a couple of other guys I don't know. I, I, I'm trying to think if I'm, if I'm forgetting anyone. Oh, George Ordazar. Sure, uh, George is great. He did that show with us with AV out at uh, Santa Anita the other year, and he's uh, got an array of uh, array of skills. Good, good guy. And uh, I, I drunkly, I drunkly cornered him one time in the Logan and told him how he, uh, how he, uh, I was having a star moment because I remember him used to do. He used to do the little like in between joke interview contest situations on TVG on Friday nights from Hollywood Park when I used to when I used to come home put a hundred dollars in my ADW and get a six pack of beer and and uh, play the Hollywood Park races. That was fun. You used to start eleven o'clock East Coast time those Friday nights in Hollywood and I never got to go to one but they seemed like they had a good vibe. A couple things I want to highlight about the show that I really like um, you know big horse players fan here and I've been amazed at how many People told me they got into contest play because of the Horse Players TV show. That show did a ton of good. But what I really like about this idea, I like the idea of it being uh, having like a real competition within the competition, not just guys chasing, uh, getting to Vegas, but guys uh, and girls competing against one another for a prize. That sounds like a smart move. And I like the idea of the the pro am, the mentor mentee, whatever it is, you however you want to describe it, because you know that gives you and Frank and George and Chris and Tyler a, and Vic a chance to to show your knowledge, but. Maybe by having those newer players, they can be a, pers- a perspective for everyone in the audience to really educate and learn without it sort of getting bogged down in being too much educating and learning. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it should be fun. It should have like a I, – I would imagine it will have kind of like a who wants to be a millionaire feel to it where it, you know, it's just kind of just a random guy just competing, trying to make some money at a random game and – uh, you know, so it could be fun. I'm, I'm excited about it. God help the man for whom JK is his lifeline. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's talk races. We'll get back to silliness at the end here if we have a chance. Loaded looking, star studded card on Saturday night at Churchill. First race we're going to talk about starts at 8 o'clock 
Eastern time. It's the grade three Matt win. It's the return to the races of McCracken. It seems like every horse that got the bad start wide trip on Derby Day or in the Derby itself has come back to win. Will McCracken be the next of these at a short number, JK? Yeah, I mean, I mean, everyone who knows me knows that's where I'm going to land. I mean, I picked the horse in the Derby. Um, now he's cutting back off of a terrible trip. I mean, you know, I, I think he went for absolute fun. Uh, I talked to our friend Matt Bernier yesterday for a little while while, while we were both, I think, traveling uh, and uh, or driving. I, mean, I don't know what he was doing. He probably wasn't driving. He probably doesn't even have a license. But um, <laughs> Mo's Mojo is, is a horse that he's interested in. And he made a really good point for the horse. And so he's one that I would consider using underneath. He was outside on a track that uh, that I think was probably inside. Uh, there's a question whether the slot moved him up or not, but he's one that I would consider at a price. What'll, I mean, it'll be a huge price. Um, I want nothing to do with Aquamarine. I didn't want Aquamar- Aquamarine sprinting. I don't want him going long. Um, and so for me, it's 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 McCracken or, or Moe's Mojo at a big upset. But uh, my uh, my Kinchin's Corner for the for the DRF video I did this week, I ice-cold singled, uh, ice-cold singled McCracken as well as another horse, obviously, a little bit later. Do you like it? Uh, I mean, how important is it to you in a pick five sequence to have a horse you can single in that first leg? Is that is that just like a single in any other leg, or does that make you happier to have it in the first leg? Oh, I don't care where it is. Um, I mean, I, I like a single no matter where it is. However, um, I am more diligent – not diligent. I am more open to singling a horse in the first leg because – you can always come back and play the pick four. I mean, this isn't an example of it, right? Because I don't think McCracken loses. But <clears throat> if there's a situation where I'm, I, you know, a, kind of a tournament type of horse, I love a horse. He's seven to one, and he's not typically the type of horse you would single in a multi-race bet. But I don't have a strong opinion elsewhere. I'd be four, five, six deep in that leg, anyways. I will play a pick five where I'll single that seven to one shot, and if if I hit it, then I'm 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 sitting on a on a on a ton of equity. However, if I miss it, then I just come back and I play the pick four. Roca Roja, maybe Rojo in the uh, in the race on Derby Day. Is that maybe an example of that? Not she's not the only horse in that race, but at a squarish three to one, seven to two, you play the pick six. You can always come back in the pick five. Is that or or was that just a legit single for you under any circumstance? Uh, that was just a legit single. Um, I'll, I'll take credit for being smarter if you want to give it to me, but that was just a single. <laughs> I was just thinking, you know, I, I would have, in an other bet configuration, I wouldn't have minded having at least a little bit of backup there, you know, some some beeline. But I thought what was so clever about it was, okay, you're either then going to be in a great spot sitting on a ticket right out the gate or you start over. It's sometimes something to think about. Aquamarine, I just want to pause on for one minute. I'm with you, anti, but I just want to point out uh, somebody – watching might say well but the horse is going to be so loose there's not really other speed i mean for me it's just a case of this is just not a horse who appears to have any kind of finish to go the route of ground is that more or less your i mean you love a you love a loose uh, on the lead horse as much as anybody jk but is it the lack of finish that gives you pause as much as anything else yeah i'm just always it's, it's kind of probably to a fault uh our friend nick tamaro uh hit this horse at when we were at keeneland i was completely against him when he was switching from baffert to lucas uh, God bless the coach, but I feel like that's probably a downgrade Baffert to Lucas. Um, and and you know if you want to look at the last few uh, you know Triple Crown races and Breeders' Cup Classics, I don't feel guilty saying that. Um, and and so I, I've kind of developed this thing where I'm just always against the horse, and it'll probably continue to bite me. But uh, I don't care if he's if he goes fifty to the half and he's loose. I don't see how he's beating McCracken. To your credit, though, J.K., when you are turned around on a horse, when a horse runs through negatives a couple of times, I've seen you uh, embrace the horse. You're not, like, completely stone-headed about it, are you? Um, no, no. I, I, I like to think that, that uh, I, I try not to let my personal um, feelings get in the way of my wagering. It does sometimes more or less. It happens when I like something more than when I don't. Um, but I'll let go. I I won't, uh, it's actually a funny analogy. I'll be honest real quick. I think it's one of the best ones I ever heard in my time coaching, but 
uh, our coach used to tell the story of there's these these monkeys in Africa and, and they used to come and like, you know, steal stuff in the village. So these villagers built these little holes and put Oreos in them. And so what the happens is the monkeys can put their hands in there, grab the Oreo, but they can't get their hands out with the Oreo in their hand. They have to let go of the Oreo to get their hand out and they would never let go of the Oreo. And so the moral of the story was you just got to let go of the Oreo. And I do that. I, I will eventually I'll eventually be the biggest Aquamarine fan if he continues to run through my uh, my negative opinions. And then, of course, you have to factor in the specifics of every individual spot, too. These gut reactions that J.K. and I both have about horses sometimes. They, they work a lot better when the horse uh, that we're talking about is running at this, in a similar situation, whether we're talking pace or, or class-wise. Obviously, when there's drops involved, when there's horses running at the distance they want with a pace advantage, all kinds of other things that turn you around. But I do find the, my gut when it comes to things like that is pretty, uh, is pretty accurate, and you also don't want to get too uh, sticky about holding on to that Oreo. Bad. That didn't end well for the monkeys, did it? No, no, I don't think it did. <laughs> Let's move on to race six. It's the Wise Dan grade two, remembering Wise Dan running in this uh, race in its previous incarnation, uh, uh, getting bounced around and, and showing his class. Gosh, I don't know how many years ago that was now. Five or six, I guess. Such a cool horse. Very appropriate to have this one named after him. Um, this is one where I think you and I are both going to pick up on the same angle. Uh, and once again, it has to do with track bias. Yeah, no, I, I, uh, I we, we're both going to be on the five and the six here. Um, I, I, uh, you know, we've talked about it a few times about how the inside of the turf course is not where you want it to be um, on Derby and Oaks weekend. And Kasaki was near the inside and Conquest Panthera was like practically scraping the hedge the entire race. So um, I would expect those two horses to improve off of that, with which what I would also call a little bit of a class drop. I mean, uh, this isn't exactly the the uh, best field ever uh, assembled for a grade two, um, and they're dropping out of a grade one that uh, it was you know was obviously going to be a productive race moving forward. So for me, it's it's going to be the five or the six, and I couldn't separate the two of them. Here's what I here's what I did do that that I was proud of because it's not something I normally do. It, it it was I kind of fell upon it and it worked out and I think it's a good teaching point where when I gave my ticket out my pick five ticket out uh, on the on the video the the uh, uh, out of the gate video we did I used the five six and the seven as a horses uh, because I feel like they're going to get the setup that they need with chocolate ride and with security risk kind of ding dong on the front end. And that one of those three will pick up the pieces, uh, preferably, obviously, the two that are coming back from the Woodford Reserve. Now, what I did is using A as B horses, I used the two speed horses, thinking that if one of them forgets that they're in Kentucky and rides as if they're in Naira in rates, <laughs> then one of them will be loose and have a, a significant advantage. And I want I want to have one of whoever it is that's loose. So I used the two speed horses as B horses in case one of them gets loose. I use the three horses I believe they'll be finishing as A horses because I believe that the pace will be quick enough, and I feel like I have both scenarios covered um, in terms of, of how the race could unfold. And like I said, it's not something I normally do, so I'm not tooting my horn. I'm actually I'm, I'm relieved and happy and kind of proud that I found this kind of construction because it's not something that I, I do enough, and, and it's probably something I should do more often. I love that idea in multi-race bets, constructing different scenarios based on pace. This, of course, connects back to the idea of race design that we talk about so much on the show. And, you know, sometimes you're just not going to know. Or sometimes what looks so obvious on paper doesn't end up coming to be. And when you have that situation, if you can try to have your, your cake and eat it too a little bit, obviously you're going to want to spend more money, as JK is with his A's, on the scenario that you think is more likely to happen. But when you have this little thing, sometimes it just eats at you in the back of the mind. What if nobody goes? You know, I wish I'd done that in the Manhattan last weekend. What if Beach Patrol doesn't go? What does the race look like then? And if you can just sometimes allocate a smaller portion of your money, you can catch some really interesting stuff. JK took the words right out of my mouth. I was just going to keep it simple and talk about Dutch win betting, five Kasaki and six Conquest Panthera. One other point quickly to make about bias in general before we move on from this race. 
um, you hear a lot of people talk about bias on the day, and then sometimes in going back uh, through the races, you'll you'll hear uh, they were running on a dead rail, they 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 were with the track that day. One thing that's really useful to be able to do is to track these things. They're, it it happens more often than we'd like, I think, uh, especially a lot of uh, armchair handicappers, people tweeting about bias on Twitter, etc., as opposed to tweeting about it someplace else. Never mind, but. The idea that you don't always know, and you can think something's real, but it's not until the horses come and start running back that you can really get a clear picture of it. How are you feeling so far about the, uh, I mean, obviously there's no better example of it than the Derby inside thing, which was, you know, briefly um, controversial, which every horse from was running on the outside uh, has come back and improved their figure, so... You know, confirm bias for sure. How do you feel about the confirmation of the bias um, on the turf over that weekend, Jonathan? Yeah, you know, it's uh, th- th- there was a, a horse by the name of Forge for Bill Mott that won. Um, th- I'm going to go blank now because I'm a bit on the spot. There's been a few other ones. That, You're so that bad. Didn't... That's why I kicked it to you. I couldn't remember the names, but I knew there was some data. You're usually so good at this game. I apologize for uh, not warning. No, you no, that. no. It's fine. I, I mean, it, I'm going to remember it right when you start talking about something else. As soon as we switch to a dirt race, I'll remember it. <laughs> no, but there's been some there's been some horses that have run back and run well. But the thing about see the thing about a turf bias, which I've you know I'm look I'm I'm still new to this situation, but but I'll defer to to who I believe are the experts and, and Duke and Paul Matisse when it comes to this. One of the things about a turf bias when you find one is it's really tricky because turf racing is still so trip oriented and pace oriented that it doesn't mean the bias wasn't real on day one, but day two, they just didn't get the, 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 the bot, you know, the, the, the pace set up or the trip that they needed to, to show that the day one bias was real. It's a little bit different in dirt because it's kind of more of an all out race. And typically the best horse on the day wins dirt races. Uh, turf is a little bit different. So it's a good, point. um, you know, pure sensation was was one that that ran last week in the in the uh, um, in the turf sprint in the Jiper, and he didn't run that well. I mean, they went pretty quick, obviously, um, but he, you know, he he was one that I thought would 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 really excel out of that situation. Beach Patrol um, was one that I thought would excel. Um, the VC Darrow spent some time down the inside. Uh, he obviously came up a little bit short. Um, so you know. It's it's one of those things that I, I'm pretty confident that it's real. And the other thing that that confirms that it's that it was kind of real is if just watching those races that, on that day, how many jocks are trying to stay off the inside. I mean, that's evidence enough. Yeah, no, that's fair, and it is a lot trickier with turf racing, and I think that's a good analogy. Um, yeah, we don't have the same kind of hard data, but you and I will be betting the larger portion of our money in that direction come Saturday night. Race 7 is the Fleur de Lis, return to the races of Forever Unbridled. Um, I had was going to try to come up with something half clever in here, but we'll start with you. Are you gonna? What did you do in your in your pick five? I mean, I use Forever and Bridal because she's just better than these horses. There's a chance she could probably run backwards in this race healthy and win. Um, so, I mean, I had to use her as an A horse. Um, I didn't have time in the video to say that I probably would use her as like a double A, um, meaning I would I would have two ticket maker windows open. I would do one where it's, it's her, Carumba, and Romantic Vision as A horses. Then I would make another one with just her as A horses. And I would split up my bet where I kind of pressed her up a little bit harder. Uh, you, you don't want her to win, and you're spending the same amount of money on her as you are on two other horses. Um, my biggest opinion here is I'm completely against Big World, um, who was a horse that didn't make sense on the day. When she won, she wired the field loose on an inside track in the slop on a home. I just there's she's one that I won't have anywhere. Yeah, Romantic Vision for me is the other one who I would use along with Forever Unbridled, uh, not to be a broken record. You made, we basically made every point if you're just looking at the PP, wide on a track, uh, where it was inside, chasing a loose winner. I, we were on to those notions of bias um, fairly early on. There weren't that many that I went ahead and just like threw in the stable mail. Don't miss this one when, when she runs back. Ran huge. That was my note on, on Romantic uh, on romantic vision so I, I one i have to use but you're right you if you use the two of them in this race in your picks 
and Forever Unbridled wins, you're actually, you're staying alive, but you're losing equity as you go through. You need to have Forever Unbridled a factor of several times more than Romantic Vision, don't you? Right, and, and yeah, absolutely. And be prepared. Uh, Romantic Vision is going to be the second choice. Uh, the, the people are just, the people have been in tune with that bias. It was a pretty obvious one considering it was on Derby Day yeah. and the Derby winner kind of won off of the bias and the Preakness runner-up you ran against the bias. It's like everyone knows about it. She's going to get hammered. So, I mean, you know, she won't be, she won't be, the, she won't be the favorite by any means, but she will be bet. So plan accordingly for that if you're trying to do anything tricky uh, into blind pools, into her pick threes or whatever. That's a very good point. Let's move on to the eighth. It's the Stephen Foster itself. Um, Kind of an interesting uh, assortment here. We get Gunrunner's return to the races. My one thought was Gunrunner guts all the speed and maybe, just maybe, get a horse to fill out the bottom of your verticals like number six, Hawkakum. Uh, Hawakum, excuse me. Oh, that, I still th- might have said it wrong, J.K. I should have. I should have rehearsed before the show. The six horse to come and pick up a piece or two, just uh, potentially as a horse running uh, in his own race at the back and passing tired horses. If Gunrunner is as good as I think he might be, where did you stand in this one? Yeah, I mean, I you know I hate to agree, but that's he's definitely one that I would use um, underneath. Uh, I, I'm going to be against Honorable Duty. I'm also going to be against Birdsong. Both of those horses obviously rode the inside uh, on Derby and Oaks weekend. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't think Birdsong necessarily wants to go this far. Um, I think that, that that horse probably wants a little bit shorter, and I think that on a fair track, uh, that's going to become apparent here. Um, and uh, Honorable Duty, although he has been a much better horse since he's been gelded, He's uh, he's not one that I could see turning the tables on on what I would say is the second fastest horse in the world. So you're seeing one bird song, eight Stanford getting getting gutted and being nowhere here as well. Or, or do you? Think yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I think Stanford could be interesting. Um, I don't think bird song will stay on, but I could see Stanford. Uh, and Johnny being kind of aggressive and, and breaking and maybe uh, flow kind of raiding Gunrunner a little bit and not putting him on the lead. Um, I would put him on the lead and, and, and kind of put the screws to everybody. But I can see Stanford sticking around for a piece. It, he's an honest horse who, who always seems to kind of uh, have a good account for himself, especially in a situation where he can be forwardly placed. And what are you, where are you going to help me out with the pronunciation of number six? I think I'm going with Hawakam. No, I think that's right. Hawakam. Okay, good. Good. I feel like I said it wrong at least twice. Let's move on to the ninth race. The last one we'll be talking about at Churchill. Uh, the Regret. It's a grade three. It's a mile and an eighth on the turf. My idea in here, JK, was for number 10, Fizzy Friday, who I thought maybe had a little bit of license to improve after a very wide trip in her debut. Um, seemed like one who's uh, perked up on the turf potentially and uh, might have the closing kick to have an impact. Did she make it onto any of your pick fives? No, I believe I went 7, 9, 11, 12 in mine uh, on my B horses. I, I had a single A in Proctor's Ledge. I think she's better than these horses. Um, I do understand that she was wide on a, on a turf course that uh, we've all acknowledged was probably better on the outside. But nonetheless, she was still super, super wide in a turf race where she lost a lot of ground. Um, I think she'll run well in this spot. Uh, I'm going to give Summer Luck an opportunity to to kind of uh, shake off the Kentucky Oaks um, fever and, and get to a surface that she might excel for a barn that excels on the turf. Um, I thought that the, the Danny Pites, the shadow horse, Shamia, um, is one that, that if she runs that race that she ran at Keelan on a, on a yielding surface could be dangerous here at a price. And then uh, Star Bear and Chubby Star. I butchered that in my video. Like I was like, Star Lava, Chubby Star. Um, so I, I think that, and I'm using those two underneath. Uh, I've, I've already acknowledged that Brad Cox will not beat me uh, in a greatest stakes race on turf. Thank you to our friend, Elliot Honaker, for that. 
<laughs> I like it. Now, my fear with Proctor's ledge, I totally see the case and is obviously a primary contender. I am worried, you know, certain methodologies of figure making are going to, over, well, in my view, overrate uh, these horses who were wide on that course, which is where I believe you did really want to be. So I was just concerned from a value point. But do you figure that's not as much of an issue in a bet like the pick five? Yeah, no, I mean, I think if you can, you know, this this bet's going to be kind of weird because I, I think there's there's a potential for, or the potential for three odds-on favorites to win. Um, so, you know, you're going to want this one $10. I mean, this is not the pick five that you want to cash for 50 cents unless two of those odds-on favorites don't win if you're of the opinion that that could happen. Now, can folks go to check out Out of the Gate and see the ticket that you gave out on there and uh, and follow along if they care to? I have retweeted it just now. They actually, just a minute ago, they, they posted it, so awesome. I, I just retweeted it. I'll go ahead and do that. But I love getting to hear your thought process. So you see a sequence like this where you recognize you could have three or four winning favorites. How does that generally change the way you're going to play it? How many times more than the minimum are you going to look to have your all a ticket when there is the potential to chalk out like this i mean let's say i'm betting two hundred dollars or three hundred dollars in the pick five uh two hundred of it at least is two hundred did not to two fifty is going to be with <clears throat> with well probably two fifty of it's going to be with mccracken and gunrunner winning um the rest of it i will spread around with a little bit of the uh, the other fillies in the race with uh with forever unbridled because i actually do think she's vulnerable although i think she's likely uh and then and then try to catch some value in the other two turf spots that we talked about uh to kind of beef the ticket up um you know i, I you know I, I don't really do too much planning in terms of what i hope things are going to pay but if i can get this 50 cent pick five to pay you know 75 dollars and i can have it for a hundred bucks then that would be fun Hundred dollar pick five, the rarefied air that Jonathan Kitchen breathes. We all, you gotta love it. You gotta. Love but I'm it. only gonna. But I'm saying I'm only gonna spend three hundred bucks. I'm not right. gonna. It's not like no, I'm, no, I'm I get it, but it, three dimes. That aggressiveness is why mm. you know. I, I I think it's it's why you have some of these results you have, and why you've had such success in the tournament world, where that aggressiveness is just like a complete and total net positive in the world of uh, in the world of tournaments especially because so many people um, um, lack that degree of killer instinct um, what's the thing you always say crush their souls that'll be a soul crusher if you can get that ticket home absolutely that'll be that's the plan speaking of tournaments i also want to mention that three of the races we just discussed are going to be part of the ongoing series of publichandicapper.com contest this weekend if you've never looked at publichandicapper.com great tool for new contest players for novice players you have an opportunity to make selections one selection each week um just a two dollar win bet on four of the biggest races most interesting races going gives you a chance to stay involved throughout the year their big contest is already underway but it's never too late to get involved there are also weekly and monthly prizes over at publichandicapper.com i highly re- recommend checking it out offers you the opportunity to write your own analyses of races as well as well as to read other players especially the uh the the ph editors uh, a couple of whom are are wise guys in the in the benevolent uh, sense um at least um they're all pretty darn good to be honest with you it's a site worth checking out i highly recommend seeing what our friends scott carson chris larmy and uh, everybody over at uh, publichandicapper.com has to say a closing thought from you jk for this bloomsday edition of the drf players podcast I'm looking forward to some night racing. I, I love night racing. It reminds me of uh, like you like we talked about earlier, Hollywood Park. So uh, I'm I'm looking forward to uh, to this weekend. The night stuff is always fun. There is a there is a line on the very first page of Ulysses. It's not actually a character in the book, but uh, the guy who opens the opens the book in in words. Uh, at one point, yells to the guy he's staying with in Martello Tower, "Come up, Kinch." 
So I don't know. Maybe Kinch will be coming up this weekend at Churchill Downs with a big pick five on Stephen Foster night. Again, check out his pick five ticket as well as all the racing previews from the weekend from the expert team of DRF analysts over at all the DRF videos and, of course, the Out of the Gate video specifically. That's it. That's all the time we got. We will be back on Tuesday. I want to thank Jonathan Kinchin. I want to thank all of you for listening. I'm Peter Thomas Fornital. May you win all your photos.